Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Beyond the Sea webinar for January. Today we've got Shelley Orr from the Catawba County Library in North Carolina presenting on STEAM programming for adults. Um, Shelley is the digital services librarian for the Catawba County Library System, where she oversees Tech Connect, an open makerspace where the public can build inspired ideas from start to finish. She delivers technology, workforce development, and STEAM programming to all age groups and has partnered with community organizations and county agencies to share her expertise and teaching experience. In the past, she served as a facilitator to introduce new technologies and applications into higher ed classrooms as faculty support for the implementation of a one-to-one -one iPad program and as a co-creator of digital literacy tools. Thank you so much for presenting for us today, Shelley. The floor is yours. All right, thank you so much. Um, so my name is Shelley Orr, and I'm going to um, talk a little bit about how this webinar will go. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about our library. Um, we'll talk about what STEAM is and what kind of programming our library system's been doing. Um, and then we'll go into what I do for our library system and how I um, got myself involved in STEAM programming. And then the new types of programming that we've been doing, um, how we turn traditional craft programs into STEAM programming, as well as um, some of our off-site visits. We will talk about our community partners and our funding, and then um, how we evaluate and some of the lessons that I've learned um, throughout this whole process. And then at the end, I'll take questions. So with that being said, we will start. Um, our library is a seven branch system. Um, we're located in North Carolina. We're north of Charlotte and east of Asheville. Um, our biggest city is Hickory, North Carolina, and we are still a, a big manufacturing population here. Um, we're making furniture, um, making lots of stuff here in Catawba County. It's great. Um, we have program activities from the little ones to the older ones. Um, some of those are, are ready to learn story times. Um, we have lifelong learning for adults with ESL classes. Um, our adult services librarian and our collaborative services librarian, they've been doing a med, not med series, um, a nutrition series that's been really popular. We have book clubs. Uh, we have pathways to pathways to careers. We offer resume reviews. We help people with applications, um, help them with job searching strategies all the time. And then we also try to bridge the digital divide. That's where I come in most of the time. Um, we offer one-on-one -on -one technology sessions throughout our branches. Um, we offer uh, technology classes that range from coding to office applications, and then giving people access to digital resources. So let's talk about STEAM. A lot of people know what STEAM is already, but I still like to define it just in case people don't know the whole thing, <laughs> the whole story behind it. Um, STEAM is science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Um, it's a program, it's programming designed to introduce children and teens, at least for us in the beginning, to science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And it gives them the opportunity to problem solve, and with that, they become critical thinkers. Um, this collaboration of disciplines has been around since the 1990s, and we really like to use the National Science Foundation's umbrella of um, science, and they include chemistry, astronomy, uh, the geological sciences, social sciences, physics, um, among other sciences, so we could run the whole gamut, which is great. It's nice to have the opportunity to um, delve into lots of different topics. So our library system has been offering STEAM programming since 2010, and we've all just started off with children's programming, um, school age programming. Uh, in 2017, our Cheryl's Ford branch, they started preschool tinker time, and it's really neat because the little ones get to uh, take tools and construction materials, um, which you can see right there, their construction material in the picture is um, styrofoam. It's a good way to recycle something, um, or at least reuse it. And uh, they're able to build and recreate things with the little tools that they have. And that's been pretty popular at their branch. 
last year I started STEAM for Adults at our Newton branch. And um, last year, and actually in 2017, our entire system, we had about 137 STEAM programs, and they were um, just for children and teenagers. So we were doing a lot with STEAM programming, and so it's nice to have those resources um, as we brought it into the adult room. Hmm, too far. So some of the popular programs that we have are for the kids have been beekeeping. We've had pie day activities, make your own bird feeder, um, and even creating magic sand. So lots of neat stuff that we've been doing. And now I'm going to talk to you about how a crazy cat lady party turned into Steam for Adults. Um, it's kind of how my interest mixed with our strategic goals and a program called K64 and how that became um, STEAM programming, which is really nice. So my current programming, really I do technology classes. I teach people how to use Excel, how to use Word, how to create an email account, you know, all that basic stuff, which is great. Um, I also oversee Tech Connect, which is our maker space. And we have a 3D printer, we've got a large format printer, a digital cutter, a sewing machine, um, some iMacs, uh, and lots of oh, GoPros, um, and even a scanner for our 3D printer. So I get to show people how to use those tools as well as software to make things for those tools. So I do a lot with those. Um, even with the sewing machine, I've helped a, a little girl um, create a quilt for somebody because that skill was in my scope. It's really nice to have a variety of things that I get to do. Sometimes it's a little chaotic, but it's good. I am lucky that um, I'm not limited to those. Uh, that I'm not limited to my title at all. Um, I'm encouraged to provide programs outside of the technology scope. Um, our administration is really wonderful. If you see something you'd like to do, they are super supportive of having you do it. Um, I work with our adult services librarian all the time, and we brainstorm different programming topics um, that we think our patrons might enjoy. Uh, one of the things that I've always been interested in doing is how do I get to do things that I like to do at work, which, you know, most people like to do that. Um, and one of them is I was thinking, how do I get to knit at work? Um, I had some projects that I wanted to get done. I wanted to be comfortable and knit. And so I decided to teach knitting classes um, to people. And it was great because we had a bunch of people donate um, needles for us and donate yarn. And we were able or, to provide knitting classes. I didn't get a lot of knitting done because I was teaching people how to knit. So that kind of backfired on me. But another program that I've done a couple of times is that I like to do make jewelry, and so we've done jewelry making classes. We've um, done alcohol dyeing and um, use fingernail polish to decorate mugs with, all kinds of arts and crafts stuff. And so the adult services librarian works with me to create those programs. Um, and one of the funnest ones <clears throat> that we've done is we hosted a crazy cat lady party. And it was great because we um, created cat toys and we had cat videos running in the background. We had um, actually had foster kittens come in and we got to play with the foster kittens. So that was great. I got to bring cats to work or at least have cats at work. Um, so it's, it was a lot of fun. Um, we've been looking at um, doing some more adult programs, uh, especially this, as you can see, a badge series for adulting. And this book that's in the picture, it's um, You Can Do It by Lauren Cattuzzi. It's a really interesting book that um, has different projects that you can do. Some of them are um, learn how to change a tire, uh, go parasailing or try fire walking. A lot of them are really crazy. But we were looking through that book and thinking of programming that we could provide um, so we could have an adulting series for people. Because, you know, not everyone knows how to cook for one person or two people or um, just neat things that we could get um, millennials in or, or just general adults in to learn life skills that they may not have gotten. Um, we've also been interested in a how-to festival. And so while we've been looking through these ideas, we stumbled upon this ALA webinar, not just for kids, STEM programs your adult patrons will love. Uh, this is a great webinar. It's 
um, archived so you can take a look at it. And there are two libraries that talk about what they did with adult STEM programming. The first one talks about um, they did microhistory book discussions, which I thought was really neat. And I had the idea of having an article club. And I was like, oh, we'll, talk, we'll get these science articles and we'll talk about all these scientific discoveries and what that means. This librarian looks at me and she says, maybe our population isn't there yet. Maybe there's some people that will do that. But I think we need to go with hands-on stuff. And that was good because the second part of that, that webinar was um, hands-on learning. And another library plan is um, Tiny Wood, which was great. I was like, oh, we get to play with power tools. That would be wonderful. Um, so they had some really great ideas that they were doing at their libraries. And I highly suggest looking at um, either this adulting with the You Can Do It book, but definitely that STEM webinar from ALA. Another part of this process for me was K through 64, and it's um, kind of our next ingredient in our programming adventure. It's an initiative that our county added to its strategic plan in 2017. It's an education and economic develop, initi development initiative that prepares students from kindergarten all the way through retirement, so that K through 64, to compete in a global economy. It's there to create a highly qualified talent pipeline to support local workforce and economic growth. Um, and this is a quote that was on uh, one of our county's um, Instagram accounts. And it, it said it, K-64 was a collection of pathways that help prepare people to personally succeed while contributing to a better life in Catawba County. And when I read that as a librarian, I think, wow, that's, that's just what a library is. A library is a collection of pathways. Um, and we help people make connections to succeed, um, whether it's finding the book that they want or learning skills. So um, we were able to take that K-64 through initiative and look at ways that we can um, have programming that, go under, that goes under the umbrella of K-64. through And adult STEAM seemed to be more prevalent um, and a better fit for that K-64. through so our results really, um, when we were taking a look at how we were going to design and what we were, gonna, what types of programming we were going to design, um, we wanted to have programming that would help support personal growth, um, that would increase interest and knowledge, and then help promote inquisitive problem solving and creativity. And STEAM was the topic that we wanted to go into. And it was kind of an easy transition for us. Um, the first thing that we did was we decided uh, to take a look at projects we were already doing or interested in and then look for the science behind it. Um, for example, yarn, yarn dyeing. I really enjoy dyeing yarn. I had a friend that had just processed a bunch of walnuts and made a bunch of black walnut dye and he was handing it out to everybody. Um, and so we decided to, our first STEAM program would be dying with natural yarn or dying with natural um, natural dyes. Um, and so, what we did is we took a look at the science behind it. We looked at the chemistry of it. We looked at the biology of it, and created a structure um, that would discuss that information, but also give people hands-on experience when it came to dyeing their yarn. Um, it was kind of neat. So we had black walnut dye, which turns everything brown, even your hands. And we also had avocados. And avocado, when you dye with avocados, it turns a really nice pink color. It's a muted pink, but it's really interesting. So we provided the steam-based structure, and then the participants were able to choose how they wanted to dye their yarn, um, whether they wanted one color or two colors or a mix of both, um, and how that would look. So they got to learn through experience, and they got to decide how the process went for them. This year, we went to the opposite of, end of the step spectrum, um, and we dyed yarn with Kool-Aid, which is nothing like the muted tones of avocados or black walnuts. Um, we had them um, 
paint the yarn. They got to the choice of painting the yarn. They also had the choice of um, doing a dye immersion in a pot. So we, the different people went through the different cycles of the different types of dyeing methods, which was great. Um, in our natural dye class, we talked about the mordants and how they were used in the dyeing process. Um, with Kool-Aid, it uses citric acid, and so we didn't really, we talked about the citric, citric acid part of it and how it sets the dye, um, but it was really neat to see how people got to, um, how the results of their solutions and how they chose to dye the yarn. They did much better, a much better job than I did with my yarn. It was really not pretty at all, but they made really nice stuff, so that was really great. And they were pleased, and it was an experience that they had never had before. So, the next one is that we did that was really successful was pickling. Um, I had 13 participants, which is a lot for me for a steam program. Um, I went through a quick PowerPoint of the reactions that happen while pickling. We made refrigerator pickles instead of traditional pickling. It was something that I was familiar with. This is a great program to um, partner with your um, county extension services. At the time that this program went on, their person that did pickling was, um, they were in between people for that. And so I was not used to traditional, to traditional pickling um, and I didn't want to give anyone botulism. So we went with refrigerator pickles um, as I was boiling a vinegar mixture for their pickle jars, I talked about the process of um, pickling and then the history of pickling. And then the participants were able to go and pack their own jars with vegetables and herbs and seasonings of their own choosing. And um, we handed out some recipes. We poured the vinegar solutions in their jars. We talked a little bit more while their jars cooled. Um, and they were pretty excited to see, you know, that what their pickles would taste like in a couple of weeks. It was really a lot of fun. And this pickling program, as well as yarn dyeing and our moss terrarium program, I have um, access at the end of this uh, webinar to a link that will give you the class outlines and materials that you need. Another neat one that our uh, assistant director found was this beautiful mass of coral. It's a TED talk. And um, what, these, what they do is they uh, do crochet models of coral reefs to demonstrate um, the math concept of hyperbolic space. We don't have anyone that is a, a great crocheter or a good enough crocheter to do this, but it's a great example of what's out there and what you can use. Um, these sisters travel around uh, with their art exhibit and they've been creating art installations using crochet pieces to craft a cor crochet coral reef. And then they'll go to different um, exhibit spaces or to um, talk to people and they'll make smaller versions of their coral reefs and give them instructions on how to do it. So it's really neat, um, a neat way to do a, a traditional simple craft of crochet and then have that be about math. And then they talk about um, geom the geometry of it and um, it's really interesting to see how it happens. One of the new ones we're going to try this year is cross stitch constellations, and it's really embroidery and not cross stitch, but we'll fix that. Um, I found an instructables um, instructions <laughs> online, and um, what we'll do is talk about astronomy and um, all of our little constellations, and then the participants will be able to um, have a hoop and fabric, and they'll be able to choose how far they want to take their constellations, if they just want to do a couple or if they just want to do a large one. Um, and then they'll learn the basics of embroidery as well. Another one we'll try is cheese making. Our adult services librarian has done this in the past. And we have this Get Cheesy Make Curds and Mozzarella um, link here that will also give us more instruction. Um, we'll be talking about the chemistry and biology that happens when we get made cheese. Uh, another new one we'll do is uh, Fibonacci doodling, and there's a video on Khan Academy that talks about that. And our participants will look at the video, and then we'll actually um, doodle some of these out, which will be nice. 
a way for me to be less fearful about math because I like to doodle, but I don't like math. So I probably doodle too much in math classes, and that's why I don't like it. But um, So the other new thing that we did with our STEAM programming is we had off-site programs. And that's where we went to a place to go tour it, um, pretty much touring it. And we had three of those. We had the science of distillation, where we went to 1712 Distillery. We went to um, Manufacturing Solution Center and then the Lucille Miller Observatory. So you probably don't know what those things are. So the 1712 Distillery is uh, located in the town over from us in Conover, North Carolina. It's a craft um, distillery, and they make bourbon and moonshine. And so we went on a little tour of their facility, and it's really small, um, and the tour lasted about an hour. It was neat to see um, that they got their grains from local growers, their corn from local growers, and how the process went from um, corn to mash to um, the distillation process itself and what happens there. Um, the next one we went to was Manufacturing Solution Center, which is in the same town in Conover, North Carolina. And this is a really interesting place. Um, I'd heard a lot about it. They had helped us with our Tech Connect space um, with our 3D printer. And it is a place where people can go and they can get put in contact with supply side chain and manufacturing facilities to create stuff. So a lot of entrepreneurs go there, and our leader uh, that was taking us around was showing us some of the products they had helped with. And the first one that made me laugh really hard was a lady had come to him and said that she wanted to make diapers for chickens. And he thought it was pretty crazy, and he thought nobody's going to buy a diaper for a chicken. Why, why would anybody do that? But that's not his job to judge, so he actually put her in contact with a manufacturer. She already had the um, equity and the cash to start that process. And so she started um, having her chicken diapers made, and they're really successful. And he thought, how, would, how is this possible? But apparently a lot of people want to have their chickens in their house, or at least on their front porch, and they're willing to go and put diapers on them. She also uh, makes little gloves for the chickens, and he thought that was kind of crazy too, but he, once again, wasn't there to judge and um, then went through the same process, and now she's selling those as well. They have uh, like a laundry facility where if you're, you say your product can stand 100 washings, they will wash it 100 times. They um, have 3D knitters there, and a lot of shoe companies are um, testing the upper sole of the shoes the fabric that goes on it, um, really neat to look at and just see all this neat stuff that's going on. They um, made socks there. They had a lab specifically for testing uh, items to see if they were true to their um, antibacterial standards that they had suggested. Just really amazing stuff in this little town um, going on. I don't know. It's really neat to see that. The last one we had was um, we went to the Lucille Miller Observatory, which is in another little town called Maiden, and it's run by amateur um, astronomers. It's the Catawba Valley Amateur Astronomy Association, and they open up twice a month. So they didn't open up um, specifically for us. We just uh, told our patrons that we'll be here on this date at this time, and if you want to come, we'll um, be talking about uh, astronomy. And the guys that are there at the observatory are so good, and they had a discussion on what type of telescope to buy, and um, they had three different telescopes set up, so we got to check out a bunch of different stuff. So it was nice. But that's something different that we've never done is that off-site programming. So the pros of that is that we got to make new connections. Um, when I did the distillery tour, one of the participants from the library um, put me in contact with the observatory because I was kind of interested in that. Um, and he had a lot of great suggestions on uh, the adult team. So it's been a good connection with that. Also, um, just giving having a little extra PR for um, us when we go to visit and for also the facility that we go to. So another segment of the population gets to see that this observatory is there. Um, so it's a little extra PR for both of us. And then also, you know, seeing is believing and seeing what goes on at um, 
the Manufacturing Solution Center was just pretty amazing and our participants were just floored by it. The cons are transportation. So we do not provide any transportation to the sites and I think that that limits um, the amount of people that go to it. Um, our branch is a, a, a pretty big walking branch um, of any of the ones in our system. We have the most, I feel like, walkers that come in. And um, so perhaps if we provided transportation, it could um, be more popular or at least we'd have more participants. And then the time, um, so a lot of the times, it's, well, especially um, for the observatory, they open at 8 p.m. and so our library closes at 8 p.m. And so it was a different time frame for um, our participants, people from the library to go, but it was optional and, you know, it, it worked out in the end. So our program list for 2018 is we dyed some yarn, um, we did some uh, circuit cards where we took copper tape and a little um, watch battery and hooked up an LED light and did a circuit Valentine's Day card. We went to the distillery, we made moss terrariums, which is a great um, inexpensive program to do. Um, we got our jars at the dollar store as well as some rocks and dirt. And then my yard is horrible, and so I had a bunch of moss in it. So I just pulled moss from my yard, and I took rocks from my poor children and some little um, little things that they had lying around. Um, and so that way people could decorate their moss, their terrariums. We went to the Manufacturing Solution Center and then the observatory, and then the last one we did was the Science of Pickling. This year, um, so we did yarn dyeing with Kool-Aid a couple weeks ago, which was great. It was a lot of fun. I love dyeing yarn and seeing what people come up with. Um, at the end of February, we're going to have someone from our um, county extension services come, and she is going to talk about planting succulents. And I will, um, we're going to plant the succulents in pots made by the 3D printer, and I'll talk about how the 3D printing process works. We'll do some more um, distillation, the science of distillation. We'll do the constellation cross stitch, make some cheese, go back to the manufacturing solution center. We'll doodle some pickling again in August. And then September, we're going to try to have a, a wild tea party, which will be new. Um, we will dry some herbs and people can mix up their own teas. We'll go back to the observatory. And then um, hopefully someone from the county extension services will help me with fermentation. So I do not harm anybody with bacteria. So looking for community partners. Um, partners can help you find your audience. They can help you with extra funding. They can definitely provide extra publicity for you. Um, it's additional people with ideas and know-how. And then it's also an alternative space. Our partners were the Cooperative Extension. We rely heavily on them. Um, and we have a great relationship with them. Um, we have an advanced gardener series here at our library and um, our, one of our other branches. And our, the head of our cooperative extension has a following. And so if we can get information through him to those people, we will get more people um, participating in our programs. We have our amateur clubs, which is our astronomy club. Um, there are maker spaces, maker spaces in our area that we've reached out to. Um, you could reach out to big box stores and they can do programs for you for free. And those programs may be um, tiling, but you could talk about uh, the science behind how grout works. And um, so, you know, there's all kinds of things that you can look for to be free, especially, and then look for the science. And then our schools, um, we look at what our schools are doing in the STEM category and STEAM category. Um, to see what ways that we could possibly enhance what they're doing and see what ideas that they've come up with. Some of the funding ideas um, have been our local grocery store has given away gift certificates to our collaborative services librarian. She um, uses them as incentives for participation. But if you could get them to give you gift certificates, you can use them for um, produce, like for your pickling. We actually planted cucumbers in our community garden behind our little library, but since I was in charge of them, the, 
cucumbers didn't survive, and so I had to go purchase pickle or purchase cucumbers for our pickling, um, which was actually fine. <laughs> but it would have been nice had I had one of those little grocery store gift cards. Um, we do a giving tree at our Cheryl's Ford branch, and that's where they write um, on the little tags the kind of supplies that they want. So they need markers or crayons. And people will take those tags and go and purchase those supplies for them. They don't rely um, heavily on that tree, but it's nice to have a few bonus things. LSTA grants are available. Our friends at the library are great at helping um, us get money for any of the programming. Um, if it goes a little over budget, they're usually willing to help. Um, our community partners, um, like our extension office, um, and then Target uh, has grants available too. Our, uh, we have a children's librarian that received a grant from Target, and I thought it was really great. Um, she used it for summer learning programming, but it could possibly be used for STEAM programming. So our program evaluation, um, I look at attendance to see whether or not people are coming to things. People love the pickling program. Um, and so to me, it was probably the, the perfect day and the perfect program. Um, I'm always searching for that perfect day. But um, I do look and see whether or not people are coming, or at least if people are signing up, too. So sometimes I have a lot of people sign up, but the weather is horrible, and so they don't want to travel to the location. So um, we do traditional pen and paper. We do the PLA project outcome survey and enter that information in. Um, but if I'm at an off-site visit and uh, we're kind of milling around at our own pace, I'll do observation and or anecdotal stories. And I'll also ask, did you learn something today? And get that feedback there from the participant. So attendance is always um, high on my list. How do I get 50 people to come to my program? So my library administrators think I'm super awesome. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to find the magic time and the magic um, program there. And I'm still working on that. But um, I'd like to get more participation on our off-site visits as well as kind of get more of a following um, in this program, uh, the STEAM program in itself. So the off-site locations, I really enjoy going and it's kind of like a little field trip for me. And it, having people explore these places to see what's going on in our county because they don't often look at the same newsletters that are out there that I look at. Um, and the information, you know, we all have our avenues for information. And it's nice to see um, an overflow into another source. So not enough time is another issue. Um, when I did the natural dye yarn class, um, it took an hour to boil a vat of water. <laughs> and so we had finished our discussion on mordants and how the process worked. Um, and so it was a lot of milling about. And that, it was okay. We had a talkative group. Um, but just making sure that I had enough time to get the process in order. So this year when we did Kool-Aid um, dyeing, I already had my pots ready for when people came. So I just kind of learned, learned that at the end. And so now um, are our questions. And we just had a few questions. Let me see. So um, there was a question from Madeline, and it said, what time did you start your Thursday evening programs? Um, we started at um, 5.30 or 6. Our library closes at 8 o'clock. And so we just wanted to have enough time to get the program done. Um, there was a question from Erin, and it says, I like that you mentioned working together with your adult services librarian. Do you utilize other staff and their skills for programs? Yes. If I have the opportunity um, and the people are willing, I will definitely use other librarians or other people to help me with the programs um, I like to deliver. I like to be there when the STEAM program happens, um, but if people are willing to lend their expertise, I'm always very happy for that. And then Paulette had a question. 
with any suggestions for solar projects. And I didn't have any suggestions for solar projects, um, but I'm sure there's a lot of stuff out there. And there is a comment from Jessica, and it says, um, make it at your library.org has some um, solar projects there. Somebody had suggested, um, one of the people had suggested um, a solar oven, and that might be a good project to do as well. Thank you, Shelley. You're welcome. And thank you, everyone, for questions. Um, and a comment that I want to add to talking about funding is we have funding. So Shelley, come come knocking at our door. Um, we do have funding every year for health outreach projects, and we love to support STEM and STEAM projects. Uh, our new round of funding will be announced in about three to four to three to four weeks. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter or Facebook at NNLMSEA. Um, that's how to find us there, and it'll be announced there. Or you can check our website, nnlm.gov slash SEA. Uh, but keep us in mind for funding, because we love to support these kind of projects, especially libraries um, that are just so fantastic as yours, Shelley. So thank you so much. I love your STEAM ideas. I love how you make your workday fun. Uh, by incorporating hobbies and interests, uh, really inspiring. So, <laughs> so thanks so much. You're welcome. Um, we also have. Uh, oh, could you f slide one slide over, uh, Shelley? Yes. Yeah. I lost the control. There you um, go. So, Shelley kindly put all together the the handouts that are there at the URL. Uh, this webinar gets one MLACE credit, so there's the URL for that. It's an evaluation, and at the end you can print your own CE certificate. Um, and this, this uh, recording will be archived, and that's the URL uh, within a week or two from today. Um, also, I want to invite everyone to attend a really special uh, webinar that we're having in February, um, February 21st from 2 to 3 p.m., that's Eastern Time. We have Dave DeBronckart, which most people know better as ePatient Dave. You might know him from a TED Talk that went viral in, uh, I think that was 2012 maybe, or some, something like that, um, called Let Patients Help. He beat stage four kidney cancer himself from his own self-advocacy and became sort of this front runner of citizen science in terms of you know, looking into everything yourself. And he's written a book called uh, Let Patients Help, a Patient Engagement Handbook. So he's presenting his webinar uh, title is Super Patient, Patients Who Extended Science When All Other Options Were Gone. And again, that's Thursday, February 21st from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So thank you, Shelley, again. It was a pleasure to have you present. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and we hope to see you in February. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>